Welcome to Mintel's Little Conversation podcast. Hello everyone and welcome to Mintel's Little Conversation where our experts bring you fresh ideas, new perspectives on how consumers eat, drink, shop, groom and think. My name is Sam Dover. I'm a senior research analyst here at Mintel writing reports on the UK beauty and personal care market, but I've also got a background in fashion and retail analysis. So today I'm joined by Diana, Carol and Jane, who are going to discuss with me decision making and the ever more complicated process that we go through as consumers before parting with our hard earned cash. So to get us started, can I just ask you all to introduce yourselves and tell us a little about a bit about your role at Mintel. So let's start with Diana. Sure. Hello, everyone. I'm Diana Kelter. I am a senior trends analyst here at Mintel. So my job is to really look across all of the consumer categories we represent in Mintel and figure out what those larger macro trends are. And decision paralysis has been a topic we've seen come up throughout our 2019 global trends. So I'm excited to participate in this podcast today. Amazing. So now let's go to Jane. Hi, everyone. My name is Jane Herr. I'm a senior analyst on the Purchase Intelligence team. Basically, that's a tool um, that Mintel has that allows us to better understand how consumers are reacting to specific new products entering the market. Um, Frequently, I see a big gap between what people say they want in our other research and what they actually say about products once they're launched. Um, So I'm really excited to dig in and better understand why that gap might occur in precious decision making. Amazing. And then let's come to Carol. All right. So I'm Carol Wong Lee. I am the Lifestyles and Leisure Associate Director here in Canada. So my job really is to look at consumer um, attitudes and behaviors and the lifestyle piece looks at different generations. And it's actually really interesting to see uh, how the internet has been impacting the way people process information and in turn how that's, that's affecting their the way they're shopping and the way they're making purchase decisions. So I think this is going to be a really fun conversation. Yeah, interesting. So from my perspective, I think I have been feel like I've been talking about decision making or thinking about it at least for quite a while because as a retail analyst over the last couple of years, I feel like I've constantly been had this message from press and clients about in the UK at least is the high street dead. And I've kind of had to come up with the same argument is that no, it's not dead. It's just changing because the way we shop is changing. But there's a really core reason for that. And I think what it is, is that consumers go on such a complicated journey now before making a purchase you know so and and that means they're going they're kind of looking online they're looking in store and that's kind of really um, fluent in terms of where they're shopping um, so from each of your unique perspectives how do you think decision making is changing or has how has it changed in the last year um, I'll start with Jane I think generally attention is such a hot commodity these days um, The information that's available to each of us is also seemingly limitless. So to your point, I think it's just a more complicated process with more opportunities for brands to kind of hijack, but also disrupt um, a consumer's typical path to purchase. Um, And so I think where brands are struggling with competing with Um, other brands, and especially these new upstarts, especially direct-to-consumer type brands, Um, but also just the amount of attention that we have to give to brands is limited. Yeah, and I feel like because it's more, it just feels like there's more and more brands out there, and because of, I guess, because of our access to online, is that we just we can see so many, you know, we can that so many more brands are visible to us now than maybe would perhaps would have been, and it just gets so kind of complicated what what do you uh, think diana yeah i wanted to build off what jane mentioned about uh, dtc direct to consumer brands because i think they're a really interesting aspect of retail when it comes to this decision making discussion um so i like to use the analogy i think there's a lot of brands you can think of from a food service example there's in and out and there's cheesecake factory and in and out at least in the states it's known for very limited options you get a burger or a cheeseburger and that's the menu and then cheesecake factory is known for this huge menu with just about anything you can think of getting. And I think DTC brands came in more with this in and out model of they launched with one really core product. Like if you think of Casper, they launched just one core mattress or Allbirds had like one type of shoe or two types of shoes when they launched. So they really made that 
focus of this is the product you need and we're going to sell that to you from a value perspective, from the social media perspective of highlighting why this um, product is going to connect with you. And I think that's what we're seeing kind of take place. There's value on both sides. Consumers like options, but we're also seeing these brands come in that are saying, we're not going to overwhelm you with options. We're going to prove to you why this one product is worth your time. And so I think we're seeing consumers grapple with that balance. Just to build on what Diana was saying, I think too, and, and also Jane is, is like, I think another element to consider is the fact that as Jane mentioned, you know, like our, our attention is, is, you know, it's, there's, there's a limit to how much we can pay attention to. But the other thing that we really have to consider is the fact that today consumers are not passive either. It's not like, oh, brands are throwing stuff at us all the time, but consumers are like, they're interested, they're engaged. And so they're looking for resources. And, and from this aspect too, I think there's more influences than ever. Like people are turning to influencers as well as, you know, looking at, like you, you used to be able to look at reviews and just get like five reviews or five stars. But now there's like, do you even, can you even trust the reviews that you're looking at? Or, you know, so there's, there's this other element too of where consumers themselves want to, they don't just want to be talked to, but they want to be a part of the conversation. And so that adds to the noise and the confusion in terms of, how, how do you make a sound decision? And I think here too, as Jane had mentioned, there's real opportunity for brands to step up to the plate and, and do more to show consumers like, hey, this is what you should be paying attention to. And the example that, I, that I've um, thought of here is, is like Rotten Tomatoes, where recently it came to light that um, some of the consumer reviews were just based on people who just didn't want movies to succeed. For example, Ghostbusters 4 was one. And so what they had done was actually now implemented a platform for people to prove that they've actually seen the movie. So you can buy tickets through their, I'm not sure exactly how the platform works, but it's, it's, it's one that you have to prove that you've seen the movie before you can leave a review. It's limitless in terms of how brands can influence consumers. Yeah, that's so interesting, isn't it? Cause it's almost like cutting through in terms of, because there is that kind of general negativity that some, like, uh, you know, some brands, different, you know, like you say, different films, things like that. There's this kind of negativity that people just sometimes just don't want to buy into something. I don't want to like something. So it's so interesting that, you know, actually, you know, companies are starting to look for ways to challenge that a little bit. That's, yeah, really interesting. I think it's also interesting, the idea of authority and expertise changing. Um, Diana, you mentioned a couple of brands. I think that direct-to-consumer brands are so fascinating to look at. And I think it really illustrates um, a Mintel trend, Return to the Experts, um, where these brands, they're not just coming out with one product to streamline your decision-making. They're telling this really deep, intense brand story about like, I, the founder, am a real human person with the same human person problems that you might have faced as a consumer. And I chose to go down this, to go on this very um, in-depth journey of gathering expertise and making all the choices so that you don't have to bother with that. You know, because you might not have the resources to do that yourself. I totally think that's a key part of that. It's just giving that expertise and that value. And I think it aligns with another trend we have, um, Challenge Accepted, which is about consumers kind of pushing their comfort zones more. And I think not just CTC brands, but a ton of brands are becoming that resource for consumers to do what they see on social media. So that's like a key role that these, whether it's DTC or even like, I think Lululemon does a great job of that, of building that community um, and being a resource for consumers to say, you know what, you can run a marathon and we're going to be the brand that helps you reach that goal. Um, So I think that's a key. When people build that loyalty, um, that's what's going to keep consumers coming back to a brand for sure. Just to build on top of um, what both of you were saying though, it's it's actually, and, and this is something that's so relevant to consumers today because the really the data really does reflect that, especially for younger consumers, the relationship with brands is also changing. It's a per, it's so much more of a personal one because younger consumers, the data does show uh, this is both in Canada and the U.S. where you're you're choosing brands because they represent your own personal brand values. So, so people are going to be choosing brands that are. Um, engaging in sustainable actions and brands showing consumers that means like if I'm buying this brand it shows to others that I'm making better choices for the environment or things and so I think it really it's it's really reflective of this changing relationship because before when you used to like a brand it used to be like oh because it's it's cool it's got a good 
you know, good, good customer service or good quality. But now it's like, no, no, the, the brand that I'm using shows my values and shows who I am. And so it's, it's a much more, it's a much deeper relationship now than it used to be. Yeah, interesting. So I think like, what, to me, what it comes down to, and especially when I'm listening to all of you, it's like, it is, it's this element of decision paralysis. We've got so much choice now and it's how we kind of, how we navigate all of that choice and how we come to make, you know, how we come to make a final decision. And I can't help but just think like we've, we've kind of touched on a few bits there, but what do we think brands can really actually do to kind of stand out and kind of help consumers that are facing kind of that decision making fatigue? Yeah, I think you hit a great point with what we see with decision paralysis is also the topic of burnout, which I think has become like the word of 2019. Um, so even the World Health Organization added burnout to their um, international classification of diseases um, in 2019. And they only cited it in an occupational context. But from a trends perspective, we know that it, obviously burnout goes well beyond the office. It's because people aren't disconnecting. And this even from retail to even just streaming, we're seen so many streaming networks come to market and so consumers are trying to have to figure out what what do I want to watch what streaming network do I have to buy um, what am I going to eat for dinner while I watch the show there's just like so many little decisions then that's what's paralyzing consumers it's just like what am I going to have for dinner what am I going to watch on television tonight and I think more and more we see that consumers when they're faced with that they're going to turn to what they know and trust more than anything. So I think brands really have to make sure they're standing out in a key way um, and really just proving their loyalty to consumers. And if something goes wrong, they can prove that they, even in the face of adversity, they're still going to come back to their core mission. And I think consumers will trust that the most. I think like it's to build the loyalty. I think brands really do have to be proactive and then take that first step to help consumers make uh, make decisions. And so this, this actually reminds me of like a mental trend guiding choice where it's like, if, if, if you offer an app where you can buy things off, off the app, like starting their, their shopping list for them, just, just based on the data that, you know, like the previous purchases that they've made before kind of helps to guide them towards um, making choices. Like in Canada, we have Loblaws, which is one of the biggest grocery chains here. They've got this one app where it, it gives you discounts based on what you've bought before. But I think that's a really great way of showcasing like, yeah, we're looking at what you're doing and then we're going to tailor our offers towards you. It'll help in, you know, and then it'll help to start your shopping list. It'll, it'll help drive your choices towards our brands, which will keep them loyal. But it also kind of takes a little bit of, of, of the work out of the, the, the part of the consumer to, to say like, yeah, like, you know, I know I'm going to get a good price on this already because you're, you're showing me this. So I think it's a great way of brands showing initiative to get to know the consumers more. Yeah, definitely. Um, I, I think one thing that kind of keeps coming into my head as well is how do we think, so we kind of, we've talked about this a little bit, but how, how do we think, you know, the differences of different demographics kind of come into play in terms of decision making so we hear so much noise that you know especially I think young consumers in particular are just empowering themselves with so much more knowledge but I don't necessarily think it's just young people anymore I think we've got you know that is kind of starting to eke out into kind of older generations and such you know is there anything you guys have seen that in terms of different age groups and different the way different ways they're making decisions yeah absolutely um so like we it's actually really interesting because like where we saw like Millennials being like, you were really proud to be early adopters. Like, I want to be the first to own everything. It's actually really interesting that younger consumers are a little like Gen Z's in particular, a little bit more conservative. And they're like, they're going to wait to see like what the reviews are, what their friends are recommending. So there's a little bit more of a conservative attitude. And it's like, as Diana had said earlier, it's not just about decisions on what to buy, but we're seeing this like in terms of how they're managing their finances. It's something that's, that's, it's a general attitude that's that's being seen across the board. I don't yeah, we had an amazing panel in the Mintel Chicago office of some um, Gen Z folks. And the discussion that they had, the way that they approach personal finance, the way that they approach purchase decisions, it was really shocking how digitally savvy they were and how, um, I guess, like, information literate like they just could manage so much research um, and were looking for so much information in advance of purchasing they were throwing out like websites and like apps that I had never heard of for like comparison shopping um, 
And I think like Gen Z and millennials, super interesting to look at. But I also feel like the the fact that our population is aging so rapidly and that a, a, a larger and larger percentage of our population is going to be you know, 55 in that 55 plus category. I think there's a lot of opportunities for brands to really study that group in a little more focused way and um, start providing solutions for healthful aging, well being through the ages. Um, that's another Mintel trend and capitalizing on that group that I think previously, you know, the boomers are, are a fairly neglected group these days. I think, um, and their purchase choices based on their life stage and based on, again, that growing segment of the population aging into that group. Um, I think they are much more, I think they're a critically important group that gets often forgotten. Yeah, definitely. And like you say, it's, you know, it's it's so interesting that, you know, they're going to be such a huge part of the population and, and they are a different type of consumer now to what we kind of used to traditionally, you know, you know, maybe not so much kind of plus 55s, but, you know, even that little bit older, a lot of those consumers are now going to be quite digitally savvy. They're going to be, you know, and they're going to be just as interested in kind of empowering themselves with information and taking on board, like they're going to have as much access to, you know, all these different brands and as much information to process as young consumers as well. I think because uh, the older segments are more affluent, it's, it's worth it for companies to invest more time and energy into helping them make decisions because the rewards will be greater. They're willing to pay more for high quality products. And then, but like you said, they're becoming more tech savvy and they're also paying attention to how, how things are being made and, and information that's available online. So more storytelling, I think, is, is going to be important and an important way to connect with Gen Xers and boomers. Yeah. And one thing I totally agree with everything being said about um, an aging population, but I also want to circle back to um, Jane's discussion of our Gen Z panel. So one thing that came up unanimously from all of the Gen Z um, panel members was they hate talking on the telephone. Um, and our dad at Mintel refers, like, reflects that as well. Um, and I think what's interesting, I recently read about a holiday example um, designed to help with decision making. So Etsy, um, which obviously is known for their artists and focus on and on products. Um, they launched for a very limited time. It was just this past week, a three hour um, holiday hotline where people could call in and they would talk to an Etsy staff member. And that person would almost be like their personal gift assistant. They would describe who they're shopping for, what their price range is, what they like. And that uh, Etsy person would send back an email with a list of suggestions for what they could buy. And in theory, I think the heart of that hotline was amazing. Like, distinguishing themselves from the Amazons of the world is a more personalized, unique place to buy gifts. But I really think it was a miss by focusing on the phone because they're going to alienate all of Gen Z, mainly millennials. And I think even for Gen X and boomers, we're seeing that even for them talking on the phone is becoming that last resort when it comes to customer service because there's just so many more options now. Um, even the Butterball hotline has expanded to include social media and Alexa even. So I think it was a great idea for helping with decision paralysis, but I wish they would have expanded it more and really focused on all these different forms of connection because I think it really would have made a more robust campaign. And that speaks to what we were talking about earlier in the, in, you know, I think it was like earlier in the discussion where we talked about like how there's no, I think it was Jane, there's no straightforward path to the journey anymore. So you really do have to be available to consumers all the time. So if you're, avail if you're available on, on a messenger platform, for example, then you're going to, you, you have the potential to reach consumers at any time. People aren't just sitting down at home with their newspaper anymore, like looking at for ads, right? So <laughs> I think, I think what you said was spot on, Diana. Yeah, interesting. And it's just, it's making yourself available in all those different touch points. But as you, as you said, Diana, it's, it's about kind of execution as well and making sure that you kind of are doing it in the right way because there's so many examples of brands that haven't necessarily got that kind of those different you know they've not opened themselves in those different communication channels and just not done it right totally um, so I'm going to kind of bring this, I'm going to kind of keep digging into this idea of demographics here. And I think what a really interesting thing is um, how men and women, you know, different genders make decisions in different ways, because there tends to be so much noise around kind of gender stereotyping. But in reality, in terms of men and women have very different attitudes and motivations when you know but when deciding what to buy what to watch what to you know you know all of these different factors so you know you've only got to look at say a category like fashion um there's a real difference in 
how men and women shop. The reality of it is just that men still tend to browse and shop infrequently, but when they do, they tend to bulk buy, they buy more items and they spend more. Women, in contrast, tend to spend much more time uh, browsing and they browse much more frequently, but they don't necessarily they don't necessarily spend the same you know that every time they go shopping they don't necessarily make a purchase um so I just think it's really interesting how you know there's so much noise around gender stereotyping but the reality of it is is that men and women are quite different still or a lot of men and women are quite different in terms of how they process information and you know come to make decisions so you know how can how do you guys think brands and companies can kind of recognize those differences without kind of going down the stereotypical route so to speak i've been thinking a lot about uh, like parents and then their their logistical challenges and you're right and one of the things that also comes up in the data is the fact that actually women still are primarily doing this shopping for the for the household so i think a really key way for companies to kind of speak to differences but without necessarily calling out differences is, is just to focus on the logistics so i think for grocery shopping for example if you focus on the fact that like parents in general will, will, will be challenged in terms of having less time, let's say for a weeknight meal. And so they're going to be doing more of their shopping on the weekends. So like in, in particular, I'm thinking of like click and collect where, where you can show like the time that you save from ordering something ahead of time. And, you know, you just stop in the store and then you go, but you can show both like moms and dads doing this. You know, it's, it's like, even though, we we the data does show that like moms are the ones that tend to that tend to be doing more of the shopping for the households, but you can still show that you know dads today are also participating in parenting and dads care. So, in here in Canada, there's there's a, an ad that shows you know this click and collect ad for McDonald's, and it shows like a dad that's sitting in the car with his daughter singing a song as they wait for their order to come. But it's it's I thought this was like a really great way to show that you know we acknowledge that roles are changing and. Um, but logistics of, of, of dealing with kids is, is still a challenge for parents, both of, you know, men and women. Yeah, definitely. And I think like it's just it's just such an interesting thing. So I think there's gonna be more and more pressure on brands and companies to not kind of to not stereotype. And obviously we've got so many more regulations coming into play where you can't, you know, brands can't kind of go down the kind of stereotypical route in their advertising campaigns, things like that. So I just think it's gonna be really interesting to see how that plays out in terms of how you reach them at different points and different channels and like you say it's you know it's kind of you've almost got to highlight different things to different people but at the same time it's making it universal and making it feel like it's not necessarily going down a stereotype route. Yeah I think it's just I think it's critically important that brands be realistic about the fact that different types of people based on distinct identity traits experience the world in a different way However, at the same time, I think there are examples of brands that do a great job of viewing a consumer as a three-dimensional person and not as one characteristic or one identity factor. So we had an amazing um, multicultural session in the Mintel office, again, just to hype Mintel a little bit more. <laughs> um, and uh, we basically saw these great examples from, from Verizon um, they had a series of ads for their unlimited plan, um, and it was just focusing on the idea of being different, and that's fine. And they represent, they used actual consumers who were, you know, uh, spoke different languages, racially different, um, and, and it was very powerful because instead of distilling them to a stereotype, they represented those different types of folks. I think it's also important for brands to make sure that the decision makers are representative of a broader group of people because, you know, too often I think we see an ad and wonder, like, how did that happen? Like, how, you know, who was in the room saying yes, okay, to those choices? Um, and I think more and more we're seeing a lot of attention on how companies can can ensure that they have those safeguards in place by representing any minority groups that they're that they're portraying in their content, um, ensuring that they are also represented among decision makers. Yeah, and I want to build on actually, Jane. I think you bring up a really great point because it's like we all know that the trend today is that the world is itself becoming a more transcultural, multicultural place. People are more and more like there's a study that was released by the UN. More and more people are living outside of their birth countries. And actually we do have data to show that at least in Canada and the U S like Gen Z's are the most ethnically diverse cult, um, 
generation to date. So I think, like you said, like showcasing the fact that we're, we're not just one unidimensional and we're really embracing diversity is something that's so important we'll, and we'll, be, we'll become more and more, more and more of an important thing to do just to say that we recognize that the world is a changing place and yeah, and we're not just defined by one identity anymore. Yeah, and it's almost about, it's kind of, it's it, it's about, I guess it kind of speaks to talking about, you know, values. It's about tapping into a consumer's values and not necessarily playing them at being, they're a man, they're a 55-year-old, they are, you know, it's, it's kind of moving away from those kind of categorizing people by those kind of, you know, traditional demographics and then kind of really building on this kind of idea of, you know, segmenting and understanding your customer and what they really want what they care about and I think that's just becoming so much more important I guess with that in mind I think I guess one of the values which I think is just it it seems to just be coming so much more of a you know mainstream message now you know and I think it comes back to this kind of idea of stereotyping is I think there's more and more coming into play is this kind of idea of sustainability eco-friendly ethical and those kind of ethically minded or conscious consumers you know traditionally they were quite stereotyped you know they were targeted very as a kind of almost like niche segment of the market and I think what's really interesting is now is that we're seeing those kind of values are kind of influencing you know our decision making process more and more and it's becoming so much more important to kind of tap into those values really. Yeah, I'm glad you brought up sustainability because I think that is becoming such a huge aspect of decision making and purchase decisions, especially from Gen Z, um, their generation that has made sustainability one of their core value pillars that Gen Z panel we had in the office. All of them said sustainability is their core focus. They're trying to get their parents to be more sustainable. Um, So it's really just there. And they look at it as like, it's our future. So we have to start caring about it now. Um, And so, and I think it's really hard in the past at least, it's been very difficult to get consumers to care about something that's 20 years or that they can't see tangible impacts from. But I think because we just hear it's more in people's face and they're seeing consequences of it, they're starting to take it more seriously. Um, But I think it's really nuanced in the sense, going back to that challenge accepted trend of brands being a resource, they really have to work with consumers um, to make this a dual process. So consumers are for sure looking to brands to do more. They want them to use different recycled plastic or commitments to do um, reduce their um, reliance on plastic. But I think they're Consumers are also looking for guidance on how do I recycle this? Is this recyclable? And um, so I think that it has to be a two-way relationship where brands are a resource, um, but they're also showing we're doing our part operationally as well. Yeah, definitely. I saw uh, there was, I think one of the, um, something really interesting that stood out to me is I think a couple of months back, um, an Australian retailer called The Iconic um, launched a new way of filtering products. It's a fashion retailer and it lets you browse products based on different kind of sustainability credentials that you want. So whether that be, you know, kind of vegan. So whether that's kind of about the ethics, whether it's about social, you know, social mobility and things like that and supporting communities or whether it's about about kind of sustainable, you know, sourcing of products and, you know, eco-friendly fabrics. And it really, and you know, you can, you can literally browse by fashion products by those different causes. So things that you really care about, you can almost shop based on those, you know, on those specific kind of factors, which I think is just so interesting. And as you say, it's, it's about making it easier for the consumer and it's about, you know, it's helping them make decisions. I think it's also um, from a financial services perspective. Um, I forget specifically, I'm frantically Googling on my end, but I forget who exactly did this, but there is a credit card that puts a limit on your carbon emissions. Oh, um, so basically takes into consideration your purchase behaviors and calculates out what is kind of your cascading effect on sustainability. And I think, you know, it's an interesting approach. I don't know. I don't know if I personally would get this credit card. (laughs) Um, But I think it brings into the discussion around sustainability and making these eco-friendly choices, the idea that um, it it puts a little bit more of the onus on the consumer. Um, But I think there's all these, and and I think it's going to do a really important, um, have a really important effect on maybe uncovering some hidden areas um, associated with ethical practices that we as an average consumer might not actually have visibility into. So I feel like day to day, I go into any shopping situation with like a 
brief list of do's and don'ts in terms of my effect on the rest of the world. Um, but more and more, I feel like seemingly on a daily basis, I'm having to amend this list and add new things that I need to be cognizant of, which goes back to the idea of the, the decision-making process is becoming more and more complicated because it's not just about comparison shopping for value. It's about comparison shopping for new issues that come to the fore. Um, my perception of how I am perceived by other people based on the brands that I choose. And and so I feel like it makes sense to me that consumers put so much of the pressure back on corporations to or brands to provide a better choice because we don't have limitless budgets and attention and um, yeah, time and effort to whittle down all of the options and make sure that every box on my list is checked. So as a consumer, I understand where other consumers are coming from wanting to put some of that that pressure back on brands. Yeah, definitely. And I think it's really interesting what you said about it. Just It's so much more of a two-way street now. This kind of consumers putting pressure on brands. But as you say, I think we're seeing the pushback on that in terms of brands and companies are kind of going, no, we're doing loads of really great things, but you know, you guys aren't perfect. You need to make some changes too. And I think that's so interesting. And I think really what we're going to see come into play is just far more visibility kind of being placed on different kind of, you know, what makes a product stand out? Is it because it's eco-friendly? Is it because it's, you know, t- helping you with your kind of health and wellness? Is it, you know, and just way more of kind of, like I say, much more of a conversation around why you're buying certain goods. Yep, I totally agree. And just building off what Jane was talking about with so many factors to consider, I think just we have another trend at Mentel called On Display. And it just reflects that everything brands are doing that and we're doing as consumers is constantly being discussed online and it's being showcased. And I think we're just seeing because of, like as Jane mentioned, issues are rising every day. It causes people to be like, I'm boycotting this brand or you can't, this brand supports this so you can't buy from them. Um, And it's really becoming difficult for consumers to make a decision if everything has a consequence. And I think that's where we see that brands that really highlight their values front and center are going to maintain consumer loyalty even through ebbs and flows. Um, Because a lot of times you see a brand get in a, a PR mess and then the consumers move on to the next brand because there's always something new and they kind of just, it kind of falls away. But I think the brands that really take those opportunities to almost accentuate the negative saying, yeah, we had a flop year or this isn't reflective of us or just explain it in a transparent way to consumers. Consumers are going to probably appreciate that and they might maintain it even if the brand could have just let it go and hope it gets faded away. I think it reflects an opportunity for brands to make sure they're building their loyalty and being transparent even if they get caught up in the latest um, issue. We did see actually like an example in the U.S. actually of a, of a company. It's not, it wasn't, the, the issue that they faced wasn't related to sustainability per se, but but we did see that they, um, so Jenny's Ice Cream had had a listeria outbreak, but they we did see that they proactively took to social media to let consumers know what was going on right away. And their transparency had actually regained so much of consumer respect and interest that consumers were actually lined up in front of their storefronts ahead of their store reopenings. So we do see that clear transparency in terms of, you know, uh, well, just having transparent conversations with consumers really does matter today. Consumers are paying attention. So I think that is absolutely something that matters today a lot more. Yeah, and I think we're seeing more, more and more kind of companies just having to go, look, we're not perfect. We make mistakes just like you make mistakes, but we are you know, we, we are doing our best to kind of not make those mistakes. And if we make a mistake once, we will make, you know, make sure that we don't make it again. And I think it's, like you say, it's, it's about just that transparency and just, you can't really afford to kind of try and cover things up anymore. Yeah, a term we've heard kind of being used is called woke washing, um, which is kind of this overarching idea of brands just tagging on to the latest issue um, to get support or show that they're supporting it. But we're seeing that consumers are really looking for more now. They don't just want to see, um, like, for example, for Pride Month, they don't just want to see a rainbow on a product. They want to see you investing um, in the LGBTQ community. So they're just looking for more. They're not just looking for, oh, we support it because we put this on our product. They want to see tangible investment into what they're supporting. Yeah. Brands today really do have to stand for something and you really do have to show how you're walking the walk through all levels now. Yeah, definitely. 
Um, so one last question for you all, um, but it's a big one. How do we think decision making is going to evolve and change in the future? So say in the next year, in the next five years, what do you guys think are going to, what's going to happen? I'll, I'll start. I think, um, I think traditionally brands have always relied on convenience, price, habit as being the things that cons- drives consumers the most. But I really think we're going to continue to see this value aspect become more and more relevant. And the example I like to use is we recently saw here in the States, Forever 21, which is known as like the fast fashion brand, um, has gone through bankruptcy, but we see brands like Everlane, which has a very sustainable mission and very transparent focus, um, but comes at a higher cost, um, show more success. So I think consumers are going to really invest their time and their money in things that they think are going to bring them value. Um, So we're going to see that model of convenience, price and habit obviously still be a very important component, but I think they're going to be reevaluated with value becoming that more of a critical thing of consumers really diving deeper into what they're getting from a company and even putting more time to something, even if it's going to cost them more. Interesting. Jane or Carol? <laughs> yeah, well, just to build off of what Diane was saying, I really do think this notion of value encompassing more than the traditional price and convenience point will really matter because if we're looking out ahead a little bit, already now we see like the concept of ownership changing. So people aren't owning CD collections for their music anymore. They're streaming, they're buying, you know, subscriptions to like Spotify or Netflix and, or even clothing. Now there's, you know, lots of subscription companies, which, which, which means that people's commitment to things will also be different. So I think companies have to be aware that the whole sense of ownership, what ownership actually means and looks like for, especially for younger generations is also changing. So adding on the layer of value of, hey, we are a sustainable company or like, you know, appealing to consumers in different ways will be even more important moving forward. I also think we're on the cusp of a lot of turns in kind of um, trends. So I think there's going to be a significant backlash to this idea of cancel culture, of like going after brands that do poorly. I think we're on the cusp of a change um, in retail spaces. So we keep touting like everyone's going online, but actually brick and mortar stores are not really going anywhere. Um, People still want to be able to have that experience. And there are some great brands like, you know, Nordstrom doing a lot to bring people back into their spaces and create an experience, a shopping experience. Um, And so I think that the decision-making process in the future, I don't know how we're going to continue to to like walk this fine line between over inundating consumers with information, but then also ensuring that people are informed. Um, But I think that that physical spaces, the experiences, that's going to play a more more and more significant part in a piece in decision making moving forward yeah definitely I think from my perspective I think yeah I think mine kind of aligns with what you're saying Jane is that for me it's about I think not necessarily in terms of how us as consumers decision making process is going to change but I think what we're going to see is an evolution of how brands and companies tap into that decision making process and I think we're going to see more and more kind of companies looking to kind of better understand you know the journey that people go on before they decide what to buy what to watch how to you know where to eat out you know all these different decisions that we go through now I think we're going to see more and more kind of companies try to tap into you know how those how that kind of journey plays out and how kind of the online and offline worlds are kind of linked and you know tied together and how they really influence one one another so yeah so I think that pretty much sums up our thoughts on decision making today um Thank you to uh, Jane, Carol and um, Diana for joining me. Um, And on that note, I will wrap up. If you want to know more about Mintel, who we are and what we do, please head over to Mintel.com. Follow us on social media. We're on LinkedIn, Instagram, Twitter and Facebook. And check out the blog for even more insights from our amazing analysts. Thank you for listening. Please subscribe, rate and review this podcast. If you like what you've heard today, spread the word and we will catch you next week for another episode of Mintel's Little Conversation. Thank you. Thank you.